Hi, I'm Jason Bradford. I'm Asher Miller. And I'm Rob Dietz. Welcome to Crazy Town, where Mad Max looks like a documentary. This episode was originally recorded early in 2020, before we knew much about the coronavirus. Hey, Asher, Jason, you guys know that I'm the the idiot whose brain has been addled by pop culture, right? I mean, mm-hmm. I can come up with these it's obscure, well idiotic references. Well, right. today you're in luck, because I'm going to start you off with a less obscure reference. We're going to talk about the number three movie at the box office of all time. Oh, wow. For just a little bit. That's not the subject of oh, today's what is episode. It? But Major League Two. Uh, it is not. Uh, um, the Goonies. Yes, the Goonies. Yes, that's what, here in Oregon. Everyone thinks the Goonies is the top of the box office. <laughs> right. No, it's Titanic. <sighs> Wait, wasn't that number one? Mm. It, well, for a long time, but yeah. we've got, you know, it's been passed. I think, uh, you know, you got some Avengers movies. You got uh, mm. Avatar, actually. James Cameron. Oh, my God. Oh, he yeah. beat his own. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Anyways, the the movie is about the disaster of the, t- the Titanic. Uh, I do I have to say spoiler alert for such no. a popular movie? No. Okay, good. <laughs> move on. Let's plus, move on. plus, the boat goes down. Everybody knows this. Everybody knows this. Um, so, yes. you know, we talk a lot about disaster on this show, and I wanted to go over the final scene of the movie. I don't know if it's final, but the boat has sunk, and this is the controversial scene of the movie where, where uh, what are their names? Rose and Jack are mm. in the water yes. in the North Atlantic with icebergs freezing to death, and they find this piece of floating debris. It looks like a door or something. Mm, yeah. And they're trying to get on it. Sure. And they, they're kind of wobbly. Cold. Yeah. And, uh, and then, then Rose is on it. And Jack's like, oh, well, I, I, we, <laughs> right. I'm, I'm, we can't fit both of us. She's and, like, ah, oh, this yeah. is so nice. She's like, <laughs> laying, she's, laying she's moon bathing on yeah. me. <laughs> I think you can see her breath. Yeah, it was a little chilly. That's not what I thought you were going to say. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm glad that is what you said. <laughs> uh, there are earlier scenes. <laughs> anyway. Okay. <laughs> Enough of that. Um, <laughs> but uh, the, the, the issue is, you know, there's these people in lifeboats, and they're, they're hoping they can get rescued, and, and she just leaves them to die. Love of her life, right there. Um, no, no, I mean, that's kind of harsh. She's, <laughs> no, I'm sorry, but she's complaining the whole time about how cold she is. And he's talking her. He's like... I remember him like, come on, you got to promise me. You're going to live, baby. You're going to live. You're going to have, lots, have of lots of babies. She says, well, you're going to die, motherfucker. <laughs> She's like, okay, I guess I'll live. Yeah, What's yeah. going to happen to that's you? A, that's a good plan. I think it's hard to think straight when you're freezing. You look really good, Leonardo, when you're blue. I like that look yeah. on you. They actually had good lighting in that scene. They were very blue. <laughs> Well, so, uh, you know, the the movie goes on. He dies. She lives. Blah, yeah. blah. Uh, but... In these, in these times, then he of, got to play that character in The Revenant, where he froze his ass <laughs> off again. Well, after get, getting attacked by a bear, <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. A, that's right. a good skill of his. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's all these, uh, uh, you know, great disaster moments in that movie, and and one of the things that uh, I was thinking about is that quote. You guys heard that famous quote? It's like rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. Of course, sure. yeah, yeah. Right. of course. Yeah. Well, I I looked up uh, the guy that said that. His name. Uh, you mean the original person? Yeah, who yeah. came up with that. Because you'd think it's just like a commonly sure. uh, known quote. But the, the guy was Rogers Morton, and he, he said it in 1976 in wow. a newspaper interview. How many years after the Titanic sinking did that phrase come out then? Long time. Wow, that's like yeah. decades. But the Titanic was such a good pop culture story. Everybody yeah. knew about it. Yeah. So this guy was the, the, the public relations manager for Gerald Ford. Okay. Uh, yeah. And uh and Ford had lost five of the last six primaries for for the uh, upcoming election and so he, he now, now keep in mind he had actually been president. Yeah. Gerald yeah, Ford. Yeah. That's kind of hard to pull off. Ouch. Yeah. He yeah. was he was not doing well. So the, yeah. his his own PR guy is like yeah, anything we do is like rearranging deck chairs on. Oh wow! On the, His own PR guy Titanic. said that. Did he get fired right after that? He oh, got yeah. thrown off the Titanic. Right, right. <laughs> well, isn't that what we're doing? We're we're rearranging deck chairs. We're we're all losing the primary right now. But all we're yeah all we're doing is just trying to cobble together solutions to just keep going. Right? You're, you're yeah. talking about as we uh, continue to expand population, expand consumption, while uh, we've got climate change, biodiversity, yeah, ban- extinction. trying to band aid everything. We're doubling down on what our previous activities have been that led us to this problem yeah, in the but, first place. Right. But that deck chair would look really nice over there in the corner. Well, it? Yeah, well, How do you rearrange it when it's like listing at a 45 degree <laughs> angle? Well, <laughs> yeah, that's where you get duct tape and put right, it on, sure. tape it to the deck. 
what we are asking for in this people, this show is is, why we do this show is we're saying like, okay, it's not going to work. The ship's going to go down, but there's a lot you can do to prepare to have enough lifeboats, let's say, or uh, to train people on how to use their life jackets properly. Or or maybe for both people to get on the goddamn door before they uh, die. That is, I mean, that, that's a tough job at that point, you know, you're freezing, but there was a Mythbusters that looked at this and they could have made it. Both of them could have made it, but they would have to do something like strap the life jackets to the underside to stabilize it. Hard to do in the panic of the moment, but, but doable. But doable. And if you're prepared, maybe, and trained and thinking about, hey, if it's going down, I got to need to, I need to use all my resources really effectively, you can probably save more people than right. otherwise would have happened. Well, so, and, and clearly the the Titanic didn't have enough lifeboats, right, right? Right. So, I mean, that was problem number one. Yes. Right? Yes. And then trying to anticipate, oh, so what happens if we wind up in the water and we're going to have to float on a door? Right. How do we jerry-rig this <laughs> yeah, thing to that's save asking more a lot. people? That's asking a lot. Let's just start with, uh, one, maybe not get on Titanic in the first place. But if right. we do, you know, let's get some And drive it slower, life. you know. I, right. I think you're wrong. I think in the huddle up, uh, as the ship is leaving dock, they should all be saying how to creatively apply life vests to floating debris. This should be one of their safety <laughs> measures. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And the vomit bags are over here. You know? you know, but one of the interesting conversations in that last scene was the people in the lifeboats were like, do we actually row into the crowds of people in the water or not? Or are we going to get swamped? Aha. So this is where you lead into the idea of lifeboat ethics. Right. Um, I don't know if, uh, if that's a common term or not. I, I had not really heard of it, um, but you can kind of get a sense of what it means. Like if you're, you got people in a lifeboat and there's people in the water, do you risk picking them up and swamping your boat or do you just cruelly sit back and watch them drown? Right. If there's not enough room for right. everybody, how yeah. do you decide? Yeah. Right. And I, I looked up, uh, there's an ecologist named Garrett Harden. He's he was famous. not an ecologist, was he yeah. really? Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah. And he's famous for his uh, uh, treatise on the tragedy of the commons. I uh, thought he was just a, a right wing. No, no, no. He was a professor. Nut job. He, no, was a, he was a no, college professor. He was professor. an actual ecologist. Yeah, yeah. and it, he actually not wrote, a good look for the rest of us. No. <laughs> well, he wrote an article called "Lifeboat Ethics," and the, it was in uh, Psychology Today. So we're not talking peer reviewed journal here, but but the uh, subtitle of that article was "The Case Against Helping the Poor." Yeah. <laughs> That was the subtitle. Yeah. yeah. Can you imagine publishing anything anywhere right. that, w- that would have that in the subtitle? Well, he, he originally was going to call it Life Both Ethics, Fuck the Poor, but uh, <laughs> but he, he softened up a right, little bit. Right, that's right. Well, so uh, the whole idea, of course, is he, he has this analogy where he's saying the rich people of the, the rich countries of the world are like the people who are already safely in a lifeboat, and the poor countries are the Jack and Rose floating around in, in the water. Oh, yeah. You know, he says it's harsh, but we, we can't pick up anybody else. You got problems if you do that. Right. It's the worst outcome of all. I think he was saying, you know, there's not enough room on the lifeboats for everybody, so how do you, how do you decide who to save? But then he goes off on this huge rant about population yeah right and basic and he is talking in ecological terms i mean he he's basically saying you know a lot of uh and this is in the 70s i think he wrote this yeah so, 74 you know oh, so, this is after Ehrlich and limits to growth and so sure there's right. a lot of this conversation happening and he was i think responding to this kind of idea within environmental circles thinking about the earth as a, a spaceship yeah space, we've used that analogy yeah. here right. on this show well and that and was he's saying that tragedy of the commons that was his original analogy yeah. Yeah, right thinking of the earth like he's saying you don't think of it you, you shouldn't think of it that way you should think of it as like some of us get on lifeboats and some of us don't and he was again pointing i think a lot to to population unfortunately and we've we've talked a bit about this around sort of ecofascism. There's been folks, you know, on the if you want to call them on the conservative right, anti-immigrant, maybe racist folks like Richard Spencer, who's one of the leaders of the quote unquote alt right movement, who have jumped on the the bandwagon, have actually referenced lifeboat ethics yeah. directly. Right. As justification for the idea of closing borders and, you know. Well, and th- that's what's so weird. So the, the lifeboat ethics argument uh, on its face seems pretty believable. You can kind of picture yourself in that scene and yep. sort of be, 
yeah, you, you know, you don't want your boat to get swamped, but it's so simplistic. In fact, I think Hardin, even in his art- article, shoots himself in the foot with some just craziness. I mean, he, his upshot for American policy is basically close the border. There should be no immigrants into the United States for environmental reasons. And he even tries to get around the criticism that he knows is going to come his way because he, he kind of says anybody who publicly questions this will be accused of being a, a bigot. But then he, he sort of goes and says, well, my ancestors, because he's a white guy, uh, stole this land. There's this quote in there where he says, we Americans of non-Indian ancestry can look upon ourselves as the descendants of thieves who are guilty morally, if not legally, of stealing this land from its Indian owners. Should we then give back the land to the now living American descendants of those Indians? He, he actually asked this question. And then his answer, <laughs> what's his answer is amazing. He says, however morally or logically sound this proposal may be, I for one am unwilling to live by it and know no one else who is. Period. The end. No other discussion. <laughs> right. yeah. This is basically like, I don't like it. <laughs> So uh, I don't want it. Me, I, I don't want it. This piece is called <laughs> Lifeboat Ethics, but there's basically no ethics here at all, right? Well, I mean, this is a really tough situation because, like, I think you're right in a sense. It's he's logical. Like, if there is a lifeboat situation and the, the lifeboat only has a capacity of like 20 per lifeboat, and you're under, you don't have enough, and there's too many people, that's bad planning, right? Okay, horrible job there. But again, right, you have to make horrible, horrible psych- sacrifices. But the problem I see from his perspective is like that he doesn't talk about all the stuff we could be doing both to prevent the, 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 the need <laughs> yeah. for this. And that's what's sad, right? It's like, do you really want to live in a world where you've, you've done this, you've created this us versus them, you've hardened all your borders? Right. I mean, there's an argument like, sure, do I want, do I want anybody who wants to come into the U.S. and then adopt the American lifestyle to do that? There's a problem. And part of like, you know, the ecologists of the world are probably going to say the American consumption patterns are the worst. We need our population to go down. And immigrants are one of the only reasons why they're going up. And so you can make these logical connections. But you also then, if you're going to do that, you should be talking about how do you have less consumption in the U.S.? How do you but prevent he's, overpopulation? But he's actually not saying that. That's he, the problem. He's yeah. explicitly saying the opposite. In if you read that piece, yeah. he's he talks about the fact that effectively rich nations, yeah, and we can call them European or Euro, nations of European descent, colonialist bastards would be yeah. another yeah. nickname, maybe. You know, being over. Um, their numbers being relatively low, mm-hmm. you know, in terms of global population, and that gap increasing because people in the global south yeah. or poor nations are having a lot more kids. Yep. And he actually says, if we bring them onto the lifeboat, we're going to get even more swamp because they're just going to keep, keep having, having more, more kids, kids which, right? is a, which usually doesn't happen. We, no, it doesn't happen. It's not based on, I mean... You look at affluence and education, yeah, as in the relationship between those things and, and population. But there's no and no point. Just like he he's unwilling to even consider the possibility of doing some kind of reparative justice for right. for indigenous native, native populations, descendants of mm-hmm. of those that were displaced and and yeah. murdered. Yeah. Yeah, right. He's not even willing to consider. Any level of that. Because I, for one, am against it. Right. And he's not willing to consider <laughs> that those in the most affluent nations and the most affluent of those within those nations right. might actually reduce their consumption. Right, exactly. Right? Well, that's that's his problem is this all or nothing argument, right? Like, yeah. you, you know, you could share some uh, some resources. You, you could be working together to solve the problem. But the flip side is also true. Now, this view to me is is utterly reprehensible. So can I add then uh, a key fact you guys may not know? Hmm. So Garrett Hardin, who, like I said, is sort of esteemed ecologist, but he's also listed by the Southern Poverty Law Center as a white nationalist. Yeah, this has been discussed. You know, the the, the sordid history yeah. of uh, some strands of environmentalism, and especially those who have been concerned about population issues, right. 
with the most negative, horrible forces, cultural forces yeah. in the U.S. and in, in other countries. And, and we've, we sometimes see the, the flip happening, which is those concerns being completely dismissed because they are being expressed by yeah. these really reprehensible people. Well, yeah, right. And you, the right. middle gets lost. The middle gets lost, You right. said something that I thought was really astute, share. It's the only astute thing you've probably ever said. <laughs> I can't wait to hear <laughs> this. <laughs> you, you were talking about, like, look, if people are proposing to close the borders or, or really become uh, draconian about immigration, especially as we're facing a lot more potential for climate refugees, for people needing to move from where they live now, that those people need to be brutally honest about what it is they're proposing. I thought if you wrap it up in an analogy with lifeboats and all this stuff, like that's not being brutally honest. Yeah, I think if if people are expressing a concern about the sustainability crises we face, whether it's their concern about resources or their concern about climate change, and their response to that is to close borders. What they're basically saying is we want to maximize resources for people within these borders yeah. and mm -hmm. fuck everybody else effectively. Right. And, but I think there is a middle way, okay? Like, for example, I think that there could be a problem if we just said, and you see proposals sometimes, open borders, the whole world should be like what Europe did, and people can move back and forth, there's no problem. And if you believe in the the globalization has got not got problem, and, you know, I, I remember when I was in, um, in California, the plan during, uh, I went to a climate change conference, and this this econo econ economics professor got up there and he he did this projection of population in California like to 2090 or something like that and how we're going to how we're going to where we're going to put these people and it was all going to go to the central valley because that's where the real estate was left and it was cheapest and the highest and best use was housing rather than food product production right, right. so that's and where we grow food i raised my hand i said yeah. well that's where we grow food for like the nation. That's like the, you know, not just, you know, fresh vegetables. Well, we'll, and just, we'll do that at Death Valley. That's what an economist would say. Well, he right? just said, well, we're just going to import it. Right? right. So that if the idea is you can always import whatever you need from somewhere else, because they're not making asinine decisions. <laughs> <laughs> um, then yeah, why not have open borders and why not just trade and, and, and growth will take care of things. But if you actually believe there is going to be a problem with that and you're going to have to localize economies and people are going to have to live closer to, you know, relying on the local biocapacity, then yes, there's going to be a mismatch. I mean, the mismatch is going to happen within the U.S. itself, mm -hmm. let alone between, say, Central America and North America. So I, I think it, it's, a, it's a definitely an attention point. And this is the thing is the right is going to re is going to resolve that tension in their brain by saying us versus them draconian. And the, I don't think the left has the ability right now to talk about this stuff honestly and say, what is the humane, sensible way to maybe stabilize these countries as much as possible? And, and you know, all, all, there's all these things we could be doing. We could be preparing the Titanic with with a lot more sense than we are. And that's what really makes me sad. Well, we've got a colleague named Eileen Christ. Uh, she is a, an environmental philosopher, and she wrote a nice article called Decoupling the Global Population Problem from Immigration Issues. She's mm -hmm. basically saying you can, you can put aside the argument about immigration. And she says when it, when it comes to concerns about overpopulation, it's a problem that we can address within a human rights framework. I mean, that's really good news. And it's really, there, there's only three pieces to it. One is you've got to empower men and women all over the world with accessible, affordable, state-of-the-art access to family planning. Mm -hmm. um, the second is agitating for women worldwide to have equal status with men. You know, it's a quality piece. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the third is providing this is the easiest, I think, providing comprehensive uh, sexuality education, you know, age-appropriate uh, information all through the years of schooling. So you, get, you can do those three things, and you have a path to stabilizing global population. But the catch is that these are policies that require widespread trust and cooperation. It's not an us versus them. It's a we're all in it together. Yeah. 
Yeah, and in, interestingly, and this is probably an unfair generalization to make, but there are a number of people who are very strong on being anti-immigration and very strong, quote-unquote, on Christian values who don't want to promote the widespread use of contraceptions right. uh, yeah. and education, right? Right. So, and, and on, the, uh, on the flip side, I think people who rightly have a visceral reaction against language coming from certainly some corners around overpopulation are and point to con- consumption being a bigger part of the problem. Yep. Right. Sometimes we'll say, look at, at programs that are being done in the global South, let's say in areas where population is growing much more rapidly than in other places, Africa, for example, as, as racist. And, and if you th- flip it a little bit <laughs> and recognize that it, it actually could be viewed as a human rights issue and it's about trying to support a population of people that when they are going to be dealing with and already are dealing with limits to the biocapacity where they are and right. cannot rely in the long term on resources coming in from outside, if their population has, has ballooned, those people are being relegated to the greatest suffering you can imagine. You totally, know? right. That's what scares me. Yeah. Uh, Eileen, Chris, she pointed out this incongruence of colonial superpowers like the U.S. or the U.K. calling for immigration restriction when, you know, they're the ones most responsible for the the coming global refugee crisis. Um, Yeah. And are still promoting sort of these neoliberal economic policies, which which remove the ability of these countries to manage their own resources. And are essentially saying no, their their resources are for sale for the global economy. Most of which, because the the richer countries have the financial uh, institutions that in debt that, that places these uh, these countries in a debt, yeah. they get to extract them. Let's let's profit from them for for as long as we as possibly long as we can. can. Yeah, I mean it's yeah. it's crazy, but I do think, and you brought this up, Jason. I don't think it's honest to say we don't have a concern here. Right? right, and we've we've seen this from some yeah. circles. Is basically say, yeah, bring everybody in, open borders. We can provide for everybody if we just did equal distribution, right? right? And the the rich consumed less, and and we provided more benefits for for the global poor, and and there could be free movement, and we're going to need to have free movement because climate change is going to create all kinds of forced movement of people, mm-hmm. and. It is true that climate change is going to do that. We are going to have, we already have, we're going to have increased refugee crisis, right? So, mm-hmm. And we need to think about how we're going to handle that in a humanitarian way. But the idea that we could just do that without any issues about resource limits is, I think, wrong. Yeah. We also have to recognize that it is part of our human nature when we're faced with scarcity, to be worried about including other people in, right? right? And and I think we have to really talk about that. We have to talk about how do we have cohesion Mm -hmm. and and take care of everyone when there's so much instability happening and people are feeling destabilized and you have waves of people that are not part of your community See, coming in. Right. To me, that's about building up trust in your in your society. Like, how, how is the U.S. going to be in a cooperative effort with other nations or even within our own nation if we're not sharing the same values and sharing uh, the same sacrifices? And that's where like, stuff like... Hardin's refusal on, well, we should give some, give land back. Uh, you know, like there, there is some trust building to be done by having a sincere apology and right. real recognition of the wrongs of the past and some attempts to right them. Yeah. You're not going to be able to write them perfect. You're not going to be able yeah. to reverse a, a, a near successful genocide and, you know, shoving people into the most non-productive landscapes and saying kind of good luck while we take over the yeah. best ag land. And, and, and while uh, basically ripping up every treaty you ever signed. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, I mean you, 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 there's, you're never going to heal that wound perfectly, but my gosh, you can go a long ways. Yeah. <laughs> and so the, to just dismiss that as upsetting. There's, this, there's a sense right now that 
countries in Europe that are more that have more of a, a, a history of more homogenized cultures, okay, like the Scandinavian countries, they are having they are having stress. They have a lot. They had a lot of people come in from different parts of the world, and it has led to some backlash. And you've seen this in the U.S., where like a, a church group will say, "Let's bring these folks in from from a country in Africa that's in trouble, and we're going to help them resettle." And it can be difficult for a community to then say. Well, who are they? What are, what are they? How do I communicate with them? Um, how are they going to work with our school system? How much is going to cost us for for dealing with the social issues that they're going to bring in? I mean, that's legitimate because when when you grow up in a culture and in a society, there's a lot that other people can take from granted about how you're likely to interact, how you're likely to behave, what the expectations are, and when a bunch of new people come in, they have to kind of learn how to get along and fit in, in order for there to be trust, in order to be the smoothness of transactions and decision making. And so you can either say, we're never going to allow anybody in, we're going to cut it off. Or you can say, okay, here are the, here's how, why it's going to be difficult. And here's how we're going to deal with that. And so I'd be interested in understanding right. how do people like build trust, build a sense of, of like shared humanity in a situation uh, rather than be very dismissive and well, xenophobic. Doesn't it start with making a commitment to doing the hard work? Instead of railing against immigration and putting all your energy into that, if you, you put your energy into committing to how do we all build a, a shared, benign, nonviolent, productive culture together? Yeah. I, I think this lifeboat question is really key for communities because... I mean, you said it earlier, Jason, it's not just a matter of borders around a nation, right? right? It's going to be a matter of some some communities being in better position to withstand yeah. the, the, the shocks and disruptions that they're going to, that we're all going to be experiencing. Yeah, you turn me on to what's called the term climagration, or there's some like Duluth. Yeah, <laughs> right. right. Yeah. They're actually, that's a, that's a flip thing, which is they're, they're actually trying to do promotion to get people to right. to move there because they're saying, hey, we're going to be well positioned. We've got water. we got all this infrastructure yeah. for a population that declined. <laughs> yeah, the real estate industry and the, and yeah. it's like... You're talking about Duluth, Minnesota? Yeah. So, yeah. They, yeah, they're setting themselves up for... Uh, yeah. try, they're trying to become the new place that's overpopulated. Yeah, right. exactly. But, <laughs> but I think, you know, communities honestly are going to have to grapple with this if they're in w- well positioned. You know, we've talked about this like uh, with the transition time movement and and in other groups that are trying to become more resilient, if they think about how they can grow more of their own food and have more of their own renewable energy, they let's say they've done the hard work right. of trying to like move their communities forward, you know, and, yeah. and be prepared for these things. N- in nearby communities who haven't done that work are going to overrun them, right? So how do you av- how do you live by your values if you're somebody who's trying to do the right thing by the planet, try to do the right thing by your community, and you care about the fate of other people? In a situation like that, and so it, it, I think part of it is starting with a recognition that there is no way that you could put a border around anything. Mm-hmm. Right. You know what I mean? Trump's stupid wall, which by the way fell over when the wind blew recently. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Is not going to work. They, they redid the lyrics of that song: "When the wind blows, the wall will fall." Right. <laughs> um, so we have to one recognize that we have to recognize that we're going to be dealing with these really difficult questions. We have to see that it's in our own self-interest to to ensure that everybody has some way of of surviving what's coming, right? Mm-hmm. And that we have to build trust. Now, I, I think that the rate of change is a really key right. question here, right? And it's a variable we can't really is it going to be possible? Yeah. To you know, do if this? you get flooded overnight, that's right. different than if you have a plan where you say this is ha- you know this is happening. We need to be anticipating this, and you're getting a trickle versus a flood. Mm-hmm. You know, you can adjust. Well, in terms of thinking along the lines of adjustment, you know, we started with the Titanic and, mm-hmm. and lifeboats there, and Garrett Hardin's lifeboat ethics. There's another story <laughs> that involves lifeboats. It probably has a few lessons here. Uh, I'm sure you guys know about the uh, Antarctic adventures or misadventures of Ernest Shackleton and yeah. on the endurance. I, read, I mean, I read one of the books about that. Yeah, is so, there a movie about that too yet? You know, I don't think there is, but there there, there should, should be. be. Yeah. I don't think the love stories I, I are going to go know. over as well. 
you know, like <laughs> it's not as good. Nobody would three hundred days like lock, you know, locked <laughs> in a not... tiny little boat. That's that doesn't yeah. great make for great yeah. filmmaking. So yeah. let me let me summarize what happened in case people don't know. So uh, the idea for the Shackleton adventure was to sail to Antarctica on one side of it. And then hike across the continent with dog sleds through the South Pole. First of all, why the fuck would you do this? Like it's, what, it's, to be the first. Yeah, it was the <laughs> age of exploration, right? Right. So, uh, and to probably show how tough you are. <laughs> so they set out to do this. They left South Georgia Island in December of 1914. That's summertime in in Antarctica. The war was already on, wasn't it? It was. Yeah, yeah it was getting going right then. So it was, it was weird timing. Yeah, um, and they sailed into the Weddell Sea, and they got locked up in the ice there. Which, by the way, they'd been warned about. Yeah. Like, yeah. don't do this. Yeah. On January 19th, they, they became trapped. So then they're in these ice flows, and they basically said, okay, we just got to turn the boat into a winter camp and wait until the ice melts. Uh, but what started happening is the ice started shifting around and crushing the timbers of the boat. Uh, yeah. You know, and basically, they had to they had to abandon ship and... And uh, form this... By the way, this is after how many... I mean, this is... They were on that boat for a long yeah. time. Well, once they once they had to abandon, they took these lifeboats and they sailed over to Elephant Island. And it was the first time they got on land for 497 days. <laughs> <laughs> and this is why, you're right, you can't make a movie about this. <laughs> Day one, we're in the ice. <laughs> Day two, we're in the ice. <laughs> Can you imagine the Day uh, three. the acting chops you need <laughs> yeah. to show the excitement that they felt <laughs> touching rocks for the first time <laughs> yeah. in 400 days? I think someone's got to take this on. This yeah. sounds fantastic. It's got to be yeah. Leonardo. Well, yeah. well yeah. so then, then this thing turns into a crazier journey. He took uh, Shackleton took some of his crew, and they made a 720 nautical mile open boat journey in, in the lifeboats back to South Georgia Island. But the problem is uh, there's some whaling station there, but they landed on the other side of the island. <laughs> so now they got to make this treacherous, mountainous trip. Which, over. by the way, do they even have food at this point? Like They're I, eating like blubber and stuff. Yeah, uh, yeah, they probably got a little good. bit. But yeah, they were like hunting penguins and stuff on the on the ice. There's a lot of fat. There were three of these men who had to hike their way to this whaling outpost and they're like, they drove screws into their boats to act as crampons and they had they had 50 <laughs> feet of rope and a, and a carpenter's ads. Now, I didn't even know what an ads was, but it's kind of like a little tool for you yeah. know for chopping into wood but it's not an ice axe no. you know but this closest is, you can get yeah this is what they had and uh and they made it and and basically long story short Amazing. they rescued everybody and got them back home safely which i started thinking of all these possible analogies but then i was wondering well i i certainly didn't think of this first so i looked it up and there's a harvard <laughs> professor oh who creds yeah her name is uh, nancy cone uh, i hope i'm pronouncing her last name correctly and she she made a case study for students to study leadership based on shackleton's uh, adventure which part the part where he fucked up and right, got right, stuck right, exactly. in the ice or the part where he s- saved all of these people it's complex. Uh, isn't it's it? probably the second, okay. but yeah. there are lessons to learn from yes. uh, from both sides. I'm sure. Just keep going. Just stick with your <laughs> Just plan keep forever. Yeah. yeah. Well, so she wrote an article about this for the New York Times uh, a few years back about sort of the leadership lessons from that expedition, and I think the very most important one, and this is something to think about as we face emergency times and climate migration, is is that what Shackleton did is he reinvented the goal of the the expedition. You know, he made a shift. Like, we're not exploring Antarctica anymore. We're trying to go home and survive. And uh, just completely redid all plans, everything that mm-hmm. that this, this mission was about. Right. Right. Do we need some kind of absolute clear-as-a-bell crisis to basically have the world wake up and this is a problem it's not just one person having to wake up it's it's enough to say okay new goals we're yeah. going to survive as opposed to I th- grow forever i and- think it's an interesting analogy yeah in, in in some ways it's it's really useful in some ways it's problematic i mean it's i mean the other thing that he did i th- think is interesting is that he kept people busy i mean there yes. there they were stuck on this boat 
Yeah. In small, you know, first of all, it was probably dark as hell, right? Yeah. Well, sometimes and, it, part of it was in the summer, so it, it never got dark. And right. then it would turn dark right. and never get light. And that's, that's tough to deal and with. And so he, he, but he made sure everyone kept doing their job. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Even though it didn't make sense anymore to like swap the decks. First of all, if you look at pictures, the thing is listing on its side. It didn't like, start all the way. That was late. That no, was I know, nice but thinking. still, I mean, the thing is. Tipping. I don't think they were swapping yeah. the decks when it was, they were swapping the decks early on when it was flat still. Well, my point is, okay. he's he's making them do stuff yeah. that you could easily argue is pointless. But they need. But purpose. they needed purpose. Yeah, and he, and and he I, gave them purpose. I think yeah. he he was really working on the cohesion. He even had sort of enforced social time right. know, dinner's right. time for fun we're you know we're gonna do games and he so kept the troublemakers songs. like the people who were depressed and who thought were like uh you know like bad mouthing and he put them in his tent so they wouldn't oh. spoil everybody else you know which tent i would have been in right <laughs> but um <laughs> you nay say do me son of a bitch you're you're next to me tonight you know yeah, when gonna... i when i heard that story i thought you know i'm no shackleton i mean because i think it you know, it takes a certain person right. to stay positive in a sense. Like yeah. he, he set new goals, but he also didn't dwell on how badly he fucked up. Right. You right. Know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. He just was looking towards the future. He was keeping people focused. And then the other piece of this, I think, is that, and I'm not, these guys are not military right. per se. Some but, were, but. Yeah. But the idea of having leadership. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So. That that's also, I think, a, a, a bit of a rub for us in the sense that we don't really want, you know, authoritarian leadership, but there is something about having someone say, "This is what we're doing." Well, now. and there's a way to do that yeah. well. That one of the leadership qualities that I, that struck me was the shared sacrifice. Mm-hmm. It wasn't him just yelling at his men to do this or that. I mean, bring he, bring me the blubber. He didn't right. just I mean, like he, say, you know, he, no, he was, yeah, he, he actually gave up his mittens to the photographer, which uh, Frank Hurley was the photographer. Amazing pictures of the right. endurance getting annihilated and in their life. That's what probably helps make this such a, a good story is you can actually Documented. see it. Yeah. But Shackleton gave his mittens up to, to this guy and he suffered frostbitten fingers as a result which i mean that shows you yeah if you're in that party like yeah you're suffering too and willing to you know you're going through this just like we are yeah like yeah. jimmy carter putting on the sweater <laughs> or like trump i mean he only goes to his resorts like what half the time I right mean, the other half he's at the white house right, <laughs> yeah, right. i mean amazing sacrifice well, that's real sacrifice <laughs> There's also the idea uh, in leadership, I think, of adaptation. I mean, look at that. Uh, I think the most amazing part to me is that journey over South Georgia Island on foot. I mean, I, I could never make the boat journey, but like the idea of we landed on the wrong side of the island and now yeah, we got to go fuck. 32 miles. You know, <laughs> and I got a piece of rope and some yarn and a duct tape and you know, like there's, it's, yeah, there's I just know. not much. I mean, it, it's funny because that made me think of uh, another Arctic exploration. Uh, so there's a little bit of a, a, a side trip here, but have you guys ever heard of Douglas Mawson? Uh-uh. So he, he was an Australian guy, also a uh, glutton for punishment, exploring Antarctica Anyway, uh, I always think of him because I read his book. It's fascinating. It was called Mawson's Will. It, basically, he's, he's dog sledding. Everybody dies. It's horrible. Uh, when the dogs died to survive, they started eating them, mm-hmm. and they were focusing on the livers yep. of these uh, huskies. And it turns out uh, a lot of Arctic animals, uh, Antarctic, whatever, cold weather animals will um, concentrate vitamin A in their livers which in large quantities is toxic to people. Oh, no. What happened? So, so the, the worst symptom was uh, your skin starts sloughing off. Oh, Jesus Christ. So Mawson is walking back, oh, my God. and the soles of his feet fell off. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he had to tape them back on. He taped the soles, soles of, of his, his feet, feet back on. And so whenever uh, it became kind of a... By the time he got to where he was going, he was like one big ball of duct tape, right? right? Yeah. So yeah, and duct tape was not available okay. in those days. But right. some so, kind of tape. So he, he he that story became kind of a family thing, like when, when you're going through hardship. Right. It's like, well, at least you're not walking through Antarctica with the soles yeah. of your feet taped yeah. on. Yeah. You gotta have that ready for your kids if they're complaining right. on a hike. But you, you think about the level of adaptation to to survive yeah. to do that. I mean, and uh and the, the what people will go the through. The will to survive is I yeah. mean, it's uh is remarkable. It's pretty remarkable. Right. So you know, I think we need leadership that will that will basically demonstrate sacrifice and then also 
ask us to do what it's required to survive as opposed to this inanity we have now, uh, this, this unreality we have now, thinking we're going to double down on what got us into the situation we're in. Yeah. There's that in we, God forbid, we sacrifice anything. And if if there's a threat that's facing us, it's because of those people wanting something, right? right? Yeah. So we don't look at all towards ourselves. We look to sort of put up a boundary yeah, yeah. and keep so them out. That's exact. Think Shackleton instead of Harden, right? Mm-hmm. Harden saying, put that boundary up. Yeah, it's fuck this it's not gonna, yeah. It's not going to work. You yeah. Know? yeah, we got to find leaders and leadership in ourselves that can approach this with that nonviolent, socially just way of getting where we need to but go. But recognizing this is an important thing. Yeah. If, we, if we believe that we all have to find a way to do this together, which I do, we have to recognize that it is going to require us to change yes. significantly. There are limits to what we can do. This is not a matter of just equitable distribution and continuing to grow the pie right? Right, and to get through this stuff. We are going to have to deal with some real serious hardships here. Yeah. Right? If we do that, you think we can get Jack up on that door with Rose and they, they could both I think survive? They, well, I don't know. I mean, does he really want? He they were probably wound up divorced at I some know, point. It like, wouldn't have worked out. It been really disappointed. Yeah. Maybe, maybe he was they, such a whiner. I maybe know. they could have just embraced right there and just both sunk to the bottom of the that ocean. That would have been much right, more romantic. Right then, yeah, yeah, we need a we need a romantic ending to this story. I think we should just go to other planet where they uh, where they uh, filmed Avatar. And just get the resources from there. We'll be fine. We just import them. Yeah, we'll just import it from... Uh, no we, problem. Let's import yeah. doors from Avatar <laughs> land, and we can all float away into the distance. <laughs> Sounds good. That's with a it. perfect vision of the future. So what are you going to get this week if you sign up for our email list? A lot of junk in your inbox? No, what? We're supposed to offer them something. Oh, that's right. Oh, let me, oh, I got something. I, I got one. You're really selling this. All right. Uh, how about Shackleton's petrified walrus meat? Mm, delicious. Mm, well, delicious. I think that what our what our listeners really deserve is a replica of Mawson's feet, and they can duct tape them onto their own feet for their, their Arctic adventures. Yeah, nobody's going to want that. This generation wants entertainment, and so I think what we're offering in reality is... Uh, an entire Blu-ray DVD collection of James Cameron's movies. Wow. Uh, <laughs> no, we're not. <laughs> Just to be clear, we're not actually offering yes, that. Yes, what, what we're offering instead is a uh, all-expenses-paid trip with James Cameron to dive down and look at the, the, yeah, the wreckage of the Titanic. Yeah, yeah, you can go. And I think Leonardo DiCaprio is going to be on that trip with James this time. Yeah. Um, I was thinking we'd offer them a miniature model of the, uh, the door. That they floated on. Yes. And there, it, it actually it fits Barbie dolls. It's the same scale. Right. So you can actually practice seeing how many That's Barbie right. you can get. Can you get Barbie and Ken on that or not? So it's either that or we'll just douse you with cold water until you, you turn blue. Yeah. And if you ask nicely and you get a friend to sign up, maybe we'll send you a deck chair. Thank you. Thank you.